What time is it? It's time for another every other Wednesday. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Can you mute Sanjay, please, Richard? Yeah, well? I can. And if we say, let's go ahead and get started, we know what that means. It's time for another every other Wednesday. All right. Welcome, everyone. We are glad to be back. I am so, you know, I enjoyed having a little time off, but it's even better getting back and seeing everybody online. So welcome to Every Other Wednesday. My name is Richard Haddon, and I am a speaker and author. I speak on leadership, employee engagement, and retention, and recruiting, and all those things that people are talking about these days. I live in Jacksonville, Florida, but at the moment, I am in Grand Junction, Colorado. And uh, I want to introduce our, uh, the other, first of all, we have to say Jeff Tobe is not with us today. Um, you never know about Jeff. He'll be back next time, hopefully. And then I'm going to let the other two of you just decide who's going to go next. Is that, are you pointing at yourself? Because I'm above you on my screen someday. <laughs> um, Michael Kerr here. I'm coming to you from Canmore, Alberta, where I live. And I'm also here in Canmore, Alberta, in the beautiful Canadian Rockies. I speak about inspiring workplace cultures, inspiring leadership, all that stuff Richard talked about, uh, with a big focus on humor in the workplace. And speaking of humor, I got a dad calendar for Christmas, 365 oh, yeah. dad jokes. So I got to do I the dad joke it. of the day. Let me get this right here. <clears throat> Today's dad joke is, I don't trust stairs they're always up to up something. to something <laughs> okay very bad uh wow. my name is sanjay nab i'm coming to you from oakville ontario just inside of toronto mm -hmm. i am a speaker and author focusing on performance and leadership um similar to michael i actually got my 10 year old a joke book for 10 year olds and the my favorite one that i saw in there was what do you say to simba if he's moving too slowly, Mufasa. Oh gosh. Oh yeah. Well, I did not get any. I did not get any bad joke books. One of my favorite for for Christmas. One of my favorite presents was, and we spent Christmas in Glasgow, Scotland, with our daughter. And my daughter's boyfriend gave me some of my favorite socks. And you know, if I'm a, I am a collector of wild and wacky socks, and I have beautiful socks with a bagpiper on them. So very cool. Hey, I didn't yeah. do the dimes. The timestamp during the meeting. Well, it is January 11, 0111. January 11, 2023. There we go. I'm so glad you got that right. I actually thought you might not, but I'm glad you did. We are out of a, practice. All there right. was a really high chance I would not get that right. So, I'm <laughs> so what's proud. the deal? What are we talking about here, gentlemen? Well, I was thinking, you know, it's 2023, and uh, who knows what who knows what 2023 uh, is going to is going to hold. And so we're going to do what we do, you know, do you know? Yeah, I'm not telling you, but I know. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, you know, we, we sometimes do what we call a brain trust, uh, where we trust the brains of our audience to talk about certain things. But what we want to kind of anchor this in today is, I wonder what the issues, what the major issues, the compelling issues are going to be with respect to the workplace and employee engagement and, uh, and culture and all of the things that we talk about here on every other Wednesday for 2023. And I want you to imagine if we had, had asked that question before every other Wednesday existed on the first uh, on the first every other Wednesday of 2020, if we had asked the question, I wonder what's gonna happen in the world of work <laughs> this year. Um, there's a hundred- been a tad chance. wrong, I believe. Yeah, we would have all been, been wrong. Just the yeah. Smidge. So what what do we think? And, and we're seriously, we're opening it up to, to the audience. We want to know what do you think are going to be the issues? Uh, what are you already seeing still as issues from holdover from last year? I would say, yeah, based on very immediate events, uh, Christmas time and today with the FAA, um, air travel is going to be an issue. Um, and it, yeah. it, it almost seems like people are out of practice. Because if you with Southwest had a crazy time at Christmas, and that yeah. they said had a lot to do with shortage of labor um, but then you had your FAA go down today and yeah. and I think that's going to be a lot of logistical issues because too much economy and not enough people um, and I yeah. think we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves and the only way that corrects itself is, is some sort of a crash cool. Can we use a different word? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah no, with FAA. no, I didn't mean it that way. I'm, I, yeah, because yeah, 
because I, I am planning to fly later today if the FAA has gotten its act in gear by by that time. But, you know, let, let's talk about the Southwest thing for, for just a little bit. And I don't want to dwell on this. A lot of people have talked about the whole Southwest thing over the last few weeks. But I, I think one issue that, that needs to be brought to the to the forefront on that is Southwest, you know, has been known for decades as having this rocking culture and being the best airline in the U.S. to work for. And in fact, one of the best companies in the U.S. to work for. And, but I would say that the week of Christmas 2022, it wasn't a great place to, oh, of course, yeah, Herb Keller, her nuts and, and, and all of that. It wasn't a great place to work. And it's not because they their culture suddenly you know went into a tailspin. It's not because their managers started treating people poorly. In this case, not in every case for everyone, but in this case, it was solely because it was a failure of systems. And I think the lesson that all of us have, you know, to learn in that is being a great place to work and, and, and having a great culture encompasses a lot of things. But one of those things is having the tools and the systems and the processes and the policies and the procedures that make it easy for you to deliver the mission of the organization. I read a comment from one Southwest pilot who said, you know, we were all there. We really didn't have a labor shortage. We were all there. We were at the airport. He said, hell, we were on the planes. But because of the, the antiquated software, and in fact, in terms of, of scheduling uh, crew, apparently it's not done by software at all. It's done by telephone. And because of that, they weren't able to get people uh, where they needed to be. And that's what caused the problem. Because if you'll notice, Delta, United, American all had the same weather. They didn't have the same problems. So, and so the question is, you know, what can we do as, as leaders to to say, let's make sure we've got the right systems in, play, in place so that people can do their very best work. So it doesn't matter what business you're in, you know, shit's going to hit the fan at some point. And, yeah. and whether it's weather, whether it's staffing, whether it's economy, whether it's bad luck, it doesn't matter, a chip shortage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so to, to Carol's point, which I think was going to bring up, but she said, you know, right, you know, they have a great culture, so let's give them some grace. My question is this, is does it afford them a longer leash? In the consumer's eyes, do you think it does? The the fact that they are known as this, and for people mm -hmm. along Southwest, I, I have, I do, I find them to be upbeat. I find them to be a, have a yeah. great organizational culture. Yeah, will you give them a longer leash? Yeah, if you got I, stranded. I, I that's a really good point, Sanjay, and I, I think it, this was a huge issue. So so without a doubt, this has hurt them for sure. But I think that is a valid point. I talk about that all the the time. If you're known, if you built a brand as a really positive workplace culture, positive customer experience culture, then you do get a longer leash without yeah. question. I think you do. I agree. You are, are way more forgiving when, yeah. it's, when it's just viewed as a one-off, as a... as a we, um, Which is another reason why investing in culture becomes so important. It, it, it's, a, it's a financial reason. So for people like, uh, a, a, again, in Canada, a few months ago, we had that Rogers outage. And Rogers is not necessarily known ever, uh, to the same degree as Southwest is. And so when they tried to fix the problem, most people rolled their eyes about, here we go again. Yeah. Right? Whereas right. With Southwest, yeah. it seems to be an, an, an albatross, an anomaly, and people are willing to give them that grace and go, okay, you messed up. Now, if it becomes a constant issue, you can barely, you know, you can simply switch your right. category A to category B. But in the meantime, yeah. it gives you that buffer it's an insurance it's like when you buy your auto insurance and they give you accident forgiveness for fifty dollars you yeah. get accident forgiveness for the price of culture yeah so so in the case of southwest you're right if if this happens again and again and again uh, that grace that people have afforded it uh, it probably is going to be going to be tested um and does everybody remember a few months ago our guest on every other wednesday jason mudd who is the CEO and founder of Axia Public Relations. Well, yesterday, Jason was quoted in the New York Times as uh, in, in talking about this very same thing. And he didn't even know that we were going to be talking about this. And he said, and you know, he's in public relations and talks about people's public image and organizations public image. And, and he said, yes, I think because Southwest is known as having a uh, positive culture and getting things right most of the time, I think people are willing this time to extend to them, as Carol says, some grace. And they're going to really have to make sure, and I think they probably are, that this never happens again. Yep. Um, yeah, based sure. on what Kim just wrote in the chat, it reminds me that, uh, again, it's a Canadian reference, so I, so I do apologize, but simple to follow. There is a very large chain 
uh, a department store chain <clears> called <throat> Eaton's that uh, Eaton's was, was around for a million years and, and they went under. And I, I heard a story that at one point, just before they went under, there was the newest CEO who had taken over, had a helipad put on top of the building so that he wouldn't have to interact with the employee. So he would just get in, go and do his thing. So to what Kim was saying about this idea of in getting involved, getting in the trenches, understanding yeah. perspective. And it's not only doing it, but it's actually acting on the information that you get. Because yeah. this is what consulting, this is what the entire industry of consulting is. Consulting says to you know the, the higher ups, the C-suite isn't, isn't allowed to interact with the trenches. I'm saying this very tongue in cheek. Uh, and so they hire a consultant. The consultant goes to the trenches and go, hey, what's, what are your issues? And they write them down and they go to the C-suite and go, here's what I think would be better. Whereas if you just cut out the middleman and have the communication go from the top level to the bottom level, from the top line to the front line, uh, they kind of go, oh, that's brilliant. But they also need to act on it. And that's that's a big key. As, as one of the cartoons that I have in my slide deck says, here's a... It's, uh, a cartoon of senior executives sitting around the boardroom table and one of them says here's a kooky idea what if we actually communicated with our employees yeah well yeah. that's known to be one of the issues at southwest is that they have known about this issue for decades yeah. and they talked about it a lot and we see where that got them so i i think this has been a real kick in the seat to them to say hey yeah, yeah, we, we know how to do this, and that is listen to people and, and make some changes. Yeah. So we asked our we asked our audience what were some issues there. What do you what do you see in uh, folks in the chat? Well, Sheila mentioned earlier in the chat that in terms of a, a, the upcoming year, there could be more political unrest. Uh, oh, you think? The, and and recession. You know, there's there's been lots of talk about uh, possible recession hitting our way in both Canada and the U.S. So that's on, on the recession bit. Does it matter? Like, I mean, the point is whether it does or it doesn't. Does that really change things that much? I mean, if people get scared of the R word because it, oh, it's two quarters of contraction. Does that mean anything to anyone? Either your business is slowing down or it's not. Exactly. I, I think we give far too much weight to what uh, to what the financial media and other media say about what a recession is. The question is, is your organization having a having a recession? Um, but I mean, I don't want to belittle or deny you know the effects of recession. And there, if there if the recession comes to the fruition that some think, but others do not then, uh, it, you know, people are going to, organizations are going to have to make decisions based on that. But I think that if your culture is firmly rooted, uh, then you behave differently in a recession than if you have an organization that is not rooted in a culture of people. And even if you look at the pandemic, there were certain organizations yeah. that thrived and others that got pummeled. Yeah. So you, but, but overall, the economy is thriving. But go tell that to a company that lost 90% of its sales. Or ninety yeah. percent of its workforce. They, they, hey, the economy is thriving. Yeah. So yeah. whereas you know, typically your WalMarts and your Costco's do very well during recession. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it matters. To, to your point, Richard, it matters more about the individual organization. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. If you're growing great. What do you? What do you? How do you keep people engaged? How do you keep things going? Yeah. And if yeah. they're and if they're decreasing, okay, what can we do about that? Right, it so that, it certainly so, depends so on recover. We we still have a, a loyal employee base. Yeah. It depends on how risk adverse you are, too, right? Sure. I've I've talked to a few of my clients, and they brought up the recession and saying how they're just being more cautious with their spending the first few quarters that they're holding mm -hmm. off on some initiatives until the fall to see how things shake out. So if you have enough of that mindset out there, then you know that starts to have an impact. Yeah. Yeah. Frederick said, let's look at Frederick's uh, question. He says, I think inertia yeah. is a challenge for 2023. It feels like we have been a bit stuck for a few years. Yeah. And there is a need to get help, uh, need to get organizations out of, to help get organizations. I am a professional communicator to get uh, organizations out of this recovery mode and into activity. Some leaders are trying to force this uh I'm just really not doing well with Zoom today, are trying to force this movement through limiting telework, which I am less sure will accomplish the goal. You know what, Frederick, I'm pretty sure it's going to do the opposite of accomplishing the goal. But let's talk about this whole issue of, of kind of inertia. Sometimes it, when, I, when I was, when I'm giving a speech, and it, it was more so in the last year or two than even than now, but 
I would talk about at the first few months of the pandemic, I would hear people say, uh, we're just not going to do anything for a few months. We're kind of trudging up this hill, but we see the top of the hill. We're going to wait. We're not going to grow. We're not going to involve anybody. We're not going to invest. We're not going to hire. We're not going to train. We're not going to do any of these things until we get to the top of the hill. And then everything's going to be okay. We'll go back to what we were doing. Well, as we know, that hill never came. And I, you know, I tell people, forget about the hill. There is no hill. Uh, you got to keep moving on. And, and I think we're exactly at that place right now that organizations, you know, and it's not that the that COVID doesn't exist anymore, but our response to it and, and what we know about it is very different. So, yeah, let's move on. Yeah. And and to, to Frederick's uh, analogy, um, near and dear to my heart, he's using science. And I mean, physically, what is inertia? Inertia is this idea that keeps you moving. And if something comes, if a object comes to a stop, whether it's a rock that you're pushing or sliding or a bicycle, to get it started again is when it requires the most amount of energy. That's just, that's physical, mm -hmm. uh, physical law of the universe in which we live. So that's exactly right. I think Frederick nailed it is the inertia is we've stopped because people slow down or stop the advertising or stop the training or stop the hiring or whatever it is. And to start that back up again actually requires more mental calories, more mindset shifting, more resources. And that sometimes is intimidating. But once you get the bike going, pedal, adding an extra little pedal here and there keeps you going much further. So I 100% I, I agree with that. That's going to be a, a big thing that we really need to be watching because yeah. it's more resources. Uh, it's more brain yeah. power. It's more money. It's yeah. more time. It's more everything. It's, it, yeah, it's a good point, Sanjay. And there is, I'm certainly, even just at a personal level, talking to people, there is still this kind of tentativeness out mm -hmm, there. Yeah. Right? That we're still, there's so much, there's things going on in the world. And it's there's like, so much uncertainty. There's but I a don't lot of uncertainty that, still. That doing, and do we really go in and hold the back response? Yeah. 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 And I still think there will be organizations that get out there and, you know, grab the tiger by the tail, as, as the old saying goes. Uh, and those, I think, who are sitting back and waiting are going to suffer. Michael, there is a great comment and question from Ashley Shannon that is about what we were talking about, all three of us talking about right before uh, we, we started the webinar. And it says, I think employee retention in state government, and she's referring to Missouri and U.S., is where we're struggling because... So many private sector businesses are allowing remote work, whereas the state has kind of put a stop to it. And Michael was talking about exactly the same thing in uh, in uh, Canadian government work. Yeah, in the, in the federal service, they announced recently, I forget, don't quote me on the date, I think it might be the end of March or something, that employees are going to have to return back to the office for X number of days. Uh, but there's pushback. There's pushback from the unions. There's pushback from employees who have gotten used to working at home and in many cases like it or prefer it. So there's that tension. And I, I, I think I'm seeing it not just in the government, but still in some yeah, yeah, that's what it was. companies for sure, too, where they're yeah, that's, this that's dynamic, what like saying. they're still figuring it out. Do it, we have it, to have everyone back? And do we have to have everyone back for five days a week? So there's still that right. still at this point, that tension with the hybrid workplace and what that might look like. And moving yeah. forward, I think it's gonna actually become part of the vernacular. When we're putting in an ad, we're looking for people. Oh we're yeah. Looking for virtual, looking for remote, looking yeah. for in-person body. And, and and again, obviously some, a lot of professions don't have the choice. Sure. Right? If, yeah. you're, if you're those a web designer. Do, you're gonna for those that do, right? yes, yeah, that becomes you're, a huge you know, competitive distinction now. And especially right I, you know, you can talk about recession all you want, Right now, there is still in most areas and in most uh, in most sectors, in most industries, there's still a severe labor shortage. You know, we hear about the layoffs and that kind of thing. Hey, that realistically, and, and I talk to employers as do the two of you all the time, and we, just, we can't find anybody. Um, so it's interesting. At, at the end of this month, I'm going to be speaking for a state, um, not an agency, an association of state employees. Uh, and it's exactly the same that, that you say. Um, is it Ashley yeah, that, yeah, that Ashley was saying uh, that we're having a hard time competing because, yeah, in many state uh, governments in, in the state of Florida, they're requiring everybody to come back. And yet uh, that, that's put us at a competitive disadvantage. They also talk, and this is, this is an interesting thing, not only for state governments, but I think it has an interesting uh, implication for others. They're saying that 
uh, that legislators believe that if we hire in the state of Florida, if we hire someone in the state of Montana to do remote work because they have the skill and they can do it, that they think the voters will object to state money paying people who live out of state. That's a whole other, what was it we were talking about earlier before? We said so much before you guys came in, we were talking about cans of worms and that just opens up a whole other can of worms, doesn't it? Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's fast. It's fascinating stuff. Right. It's an interesting yeah. question to ponder too, since we're we're all about culture here and talking about positive, inspiring culture trumping everything. So, if you are an employee, uh, does would would you how how here's what I'm trying to say because I too am a professional speaker. How would you how would you value how would some people value when this all washes out, working in a really positive, supportive culture. However, you have to be at the office, whereas you'd prefer not to be, versus I get to work at home, but I work for an organization where the culture is not ideal, but I'm willing to trade that off. Yeah, my culture kind of sucks, fascinating. but I get to work at home, and that's, the thing and is water that's a more will, important value for me. Yeah, well, water will find its level. The reality yeah. is we're going to both kind of organizations will exist. There's going to be these happy-go-lucky, sing kumbaya, uh, organizations where people meet every day and love it and that's perfect for them and there's others that don't give a flying rat about your dog's name or your cousin's barbecue and just let me do my work and I want to be miserable and the reality is that can be a healthy workplace culture for the right person really what this game is about is assessing and analyzing fit and putting people in the right spot yeah uh, it's not to say hey you need to care about Michael's dog no, no, I don't. Uh, if I don't care and Michael doesn't care, then, you know, we don't have an issue. So to try to say that there's one way it should be, and that's that's where you get the, the resistance. You have to come back in the workplace. You have to do it this way. And people are like, no, I don't want to. Um, it, it, and I, I, like I said, I think it's going to evolve in a way that there's going to be, okay, we are a virtual team or we are a in-person team. And this is what we're looking. The expectation is you come in five days a week or seven days a week or two days a week. And that's just going to be part of the way we communicate moving forward. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Hey. Don't you think it's still a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, supply and demand. And as I've said many times to, to employers, if you can find enough people willing to work under your rules, go for it. If you can't, gosh, if you've got any brains at all, you're going to change the rules. Yeah. And and it, and it, a lot of it comes back to expectations, right? Yeah. Very clearly defining what your workplace culture is, what, what the expectations are for where people work, how people work, you know, just laying out the, the rules of the road, being as proactive as possible. And again, when we talk about this, this dichotomy again between working from home and working uh, remotely, and we've talked about this many times, if, if, if you're you you feel you need to bring your employees back then give them a reason to come yeah out. what do you got work on your workplace back? culture and look at the lessons that you've yeah. learned why are your employees happier working at home remotely and what can you do maybe you can't solve all of those issues but what can you do to ease some of those stressors of them returning to their office what can yeah. you do to ramp up your culture be more intentional about your culture so people really do want to be at your office and focus on the benefits and the positives of being together i have a quick aside though i want to get to about this because I, I just love this I, I just heard this wonderfully wonderfully charming story yesterday i was being um interviewed on a podcast and the the podcast host was telling me how when the pandemic hit, of course, like everyone, he was working from home. He also had to homeschool a, his young daughter, who was five or six, very young at the time. And so because he had this young daughter always around with him, she became a constant feature in Zoom meetings. They were always seeing his kind young like daughter Elvis. in the background. Like Elvis in your case. Like Elvis, exactly. Even like my son home. Elvis over here. Um, so everybody got to know her name. So he said the most fabulous thing happened, a package. The doorbell rings one day, there is a package. There is a handwritten note from the CEO of his company and a gift package for his daughter. 
thanking his daughter for being part of the support team for his dad, for helping his dad do yeah. his job so effectively. And he said, now my little daughter, my young daughter is now the biggest ambassador for our yeah. company. She thinks yeah. that daddy works for an incredibly cool company. Like what a, what a great gesture. What a great, and, yeah. And what a, gra- what a fantastic, and, and I know this is not why they did it, but think about the grassroots implication of that. So who knows what the package is? I don't care if it's 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, it doesn't matter. But that small little investment, that kid goes back to school and says, my daddy works here. They're fantastic. And yeah. creates a brand that you cannot buy for a five can't buy that. commercial yeah. spot at the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah you um, can't even hire Jason Mudd to create that, no. uh, that kind of brand for you. But making um, that personal connection, right? By the way, yeah. Ashley's asking, what is the podcast, Michael? Yeah. Oh, it'll, it'll, I, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't know this because it was an hour interview. It'll come out. Uh, it'll, I'll, I'll, I'll let folks know when it comes out. It won't be out for a few weeks. But was, what is the name of the podcast? Around. What, what is the podcast itself? What is the name of the podcast? And he doesn't remember. That's what he's yeah, saying. Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> okay. They say, they say so memory is, podcast I'm, I'm really podcast. hoping that the, I could look it up. Well, they say will. memory is the second thing to it's, go. It's, yeah, it's, right. Um, uh, Rob uh, is, is asking, uh, and by the way, Rob, uh, belated uh, happy birthday. Um, uh, Rob is asking, has Elon Musk backtracked on his in-office mandate? Well, I know that he did after some really pretty intense uh, pushback on it. I don't know that he has, I, I don't know the, the full answer to that. I know that at first he did because he said, everybody has to come back in the office. And they said, no, we don't. And, and uh, then he couldn't get enough people. And so he said, okay, let's, let's change a little bit of that. But I, I think no. that might have just been reactionary. And I don't know if it's really understanding that we have to, we have to burn the available fuel. We have to use who we have in the workplace who's work, willing to come and work for us. Now, Elon would never backtrack. By the way, quick little uh, sidetrack on Elon Musk. So Elon Musk, attended Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario for a couple of years. And uh, that's actually where I did my undergrad. And he actually left the same year I arrived. So he left in May and I, I, I arrived in uh, September. And so as I like to tell the story, the school wasn't big enough for the two of us. So right. <laughs> others may differ in their recollection, but there you go. And your point on that? Uh, such no is. point whatsoever. <laughs> okay. no, that, that, as per cool. usual, no point whatsoever. So, no, yeah, that, just, that's... just no point at all. Great. Um, we were talking, you know, Michael, you were saying, um, there's a bit of a Twitter. Thank you, Carol. That was funny. Um, you were saying this whole idea of, of why we have intentional culture. And the reality is this is you will have an organizational culture. No matter what you do or not do, your organization will have a culture. And yeah. whether it's intentional by design or by default determines a whole heck of a lot of things. How much leeway do you have, like Southwest versus Rogers? Um, you know, how much will the employees support you? Um, how much money will you make? Uh, how much uh, value will you create? It, it has to do with this. And, and it keeps coming back to, it is morally, financially, spiritually, everythingly uh, smarter to invest in culture. It pays back in dividends so many times over and over again. So. Yep. All right. So what, what other ideas do we have uh, to our great, uh, <laughs> you can't run from the sun, Richard. I know it's terrible. The sun is just moving all over the place here in Grand Junction, Colorado. Okay. I got the name of the podcast. I'm putting it in the all chat. Right. Insights at work from ADP Canada. They have great, they have great. Yes. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> They, they, they have great podcasts. And I got to tell you, just on a, you know, on a personal slash professional speaker note, so impressed with this podcast interview where he read my last three books. Like this gentleman did his homework, had four pages of notes. So uh, it was a good conversation. So that's very cool. Other than that, he, was, he looked at your bio and said, oh, yeah, I, got, I, I need some material to talk about this I know, guy. Right? I know, I know. Hey, and, and back to your point, Sanjay, about all the reasons to focus on culture. One thing I always try to circle back to too is just regardless of all those things, let's just remind ourselves constantly that it's just the right thing to do. Like it's just the right thing to do to treat 
humans in a humane way that and, and let's remember that work has a huge impact on our mental and physical health and families and marriages and kids and dogs and our life and it's the single biggest use of our waking hours in this short thing called life so we owe it to our employees yeah, it, and their families and our souls you, you also know you also know um michael that there are people who are in charge of organizations who really don't care about that I know, and that's sad, and they should we not be in charge of those organizations. Of it, but they're, yeah. yeah, they don't buy into it. It's all airy fairy stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. And well, and that's that's when you do hard. have to then remind them of, okay, here are the bottom line results that happen when you focus intentionally. Oh, I know a book where you can actually find company. some of that. You what? I know a book where you can actually find real research on that. Is that your book? Yeah, contented cows give better milk, and contented oh. cows still give better milk. Nice, nice plug. Richard, oh, Andrew, you, brought, you brought it up. A moment from today's sponsor, Richard. You Andrew, brought it up. Author. Well, I did. It's a great I, book. People actually, should buy the book. Ashley, to your point, um, yeah. Mike Kerr is going to be running a course called How Not to Be an a -hole. Yeah. Well, and as long <laughs> as we're plugging Is that your sarcasm books. goal? No. It's I mean, a, uh, the service oh, did, did you see read what Ashley wrote? She can provide all the training you want, but you can't oh. teach them how to be an a -hole. Uh, so, well, And that great. reminds me of a theme of another great book that I've read. The Jerk Free Workplace. That's the one, yeah. Yes, excellent. Oh, I took me yeah, a you, beat there. To you and all your little... shameless book plugs. There you go. It's over yeah. there. It's right there, The Jerk Free Workplace. Um, yeah. But you know what? Actually, to, to, to Shannon, uh, to Ashley's point, yes, agreed. But there's an old, I think it's an ancient Chinese proverb that says, you can't stick your hand in a pot of glue without it having gets getting some of it stuck on you. And so although you can't teach someone how to be an how not to be an a-hole, what you can do is create a culture where people kind of either go with the flow because it's so predominant that we care and we're being respectful and we're trying to create value and we're supporting one another, or it gives them the heebie-jeebies and they leave and you get natural attrition. So although you can't change people, you can put them in an environment or create an environment where they go, oh, the way I'm doing it, it's not working. Uh, I'm creating friction, I'm miserable, it's causing me stress. Uh, and then <laughs> kind of get that peer accountability. And then people all of a sudden want to change themselves. So I, I, if you can yell at someone and say, behave, do this, don't do this, jump and pee when I say, and you can get them to do it. The problem is it's not sustainable. And what happens is it creates more stress. It creates anxiety. It creates a miserable, a miserable culture. So you, again, the same approach still serves in how to how to how to deal with those people. Did, did you say pee when you want to? I'm concerned about what workplace. You know, when you say that, I've done a lot of work with educators, and yeah. educators, I've heard them, I've heard them say that often. They go, the first week back after the summer holidays is one of the biggest issues because now all of a sudden they can't pee on their schedule. <laughs> right? They have to go during the breaks. They have to, anyways. So, but and to your point, Sanjay, though, if you have jerks at work, if you have a-holes at work. It's because you tolerate them. It's because you 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 have a system, you have a culture that has rewarded that behavior along the way. Your culture is only as good as your the lowest common denominator behavior that you tolerate. There is a you, financial institution service company, big company in, I think they're based in New York City, very conservative industry. They have made a name for themselves by uh, say, and they use the actual word, they do not hire a-holes they are very public about that they're very outspoken about that and so and and that is what first and foremost you have to focus on right get your hiring right and not hire jerks to begin with because to ashley's point it's really hard to train somebody out of their natural personality yeah. so don't hire them to begin with and this company makes it really clear we don't how care how brilliant you are how fantastic you look on paper if you are an a-hole you are not going to work with <clears> us <throat> You know, it, it's funny you should say that. I, I'm i a poker player, have been for years, and there's a uh, a poker tournament in Waterloo, Ontario. They run it every quarter, at least they did prior to the pandemic. And they, they it, it's, it's, it's a low, it's like a $100 buy-in, but it's very laid back and it's a very fun tournament to play in. And they even have like a trophy and it, it, it's fun. They advertise it as networking and it really does. I've actually gotten speaks from it by going and meeting people and stuff. But that's their tagline. It's no a-holes allowed. Yeah. And, and they don't, because you can get people, especially if there's money involved, people start really acting like jerks, but sometimes calling it out and, and labeling yourself by 
what your standards are, even if it's blatant like that. Um, and it, again, using the word a-hole attracts or detracts certain types of people. Some people can resonate with that. Other people, it turns them off. Either way, it's good because you're showing who you authentically are. And people go, right. I want to play in that sandbox or I don't. Right. And you're, it, it's a great filter. Right. And so they I, actually talk about that, Sanjay, too. They talk about how, yeah, it's, it's kind of controversial that they actually use the word in their writing, in their terms. But they say, but that, that, that's us. And that helps filter out people that aren't going to be comfortable in our culture. Yep. We have a little bit of a thread going on uh, in the chat right now, which is an interesting point. Carol says jerkiness doesn't show up in the interview, does it? It shows itself later. Shannon says, good point. Rob says, Carol, reference checks can often help in identifying. I think all of, I think all of those three statements are, are valid. Uh, and it's interesting because just last week, I was talking with a friend of mine who uh, about less than a year ago retired as the CEO of a hospital company. And uh, was, you know, enjoying his retirement and so forth and so on. They replaced him with someone. Um, just last week, my friend was called back uh, into service at this hospital because the CEO that they hired to replace him had been fired for essentially being an a-hole. And, you know, I said, how did they not see that in, you know, in the interview? They had, you know, he had them all buffaloed. He said, yeah, he really did. Um, and, and then... You know, he said, you know what they you know what they did? They didn't do any reference checks because they bought this idea that that you can't do reference checks in the United States because people will say, all we can tell you is, you know, did they work here before? There's all kind of reference checks legally that that you can do that to Rob's point, you know, if you if you do enough research, if you do enough due diligence, you'll get to see some threads. You know, there's some things uh, that are we're not really comfortable with in this. So anyway, this guy essentially was, was an a-hole. And they said, you know, you're destroying our our culture in the community. It's a rural community, small community. We're not going to do that. Please, to my friend, please come back and save us while we see if we can do a better job of hiring your replacement. Yeah. Um, and by the way, it, it's easy to get duped. Um, it, it really is. Yeah. Like, I actually have a, have a very dear friend I know very intimately. And he was asked to be part of this podcast called Every Other Wednesday. And he thought the other three guys were, were not jerks. And then he got suckered in. And, Anyways, uh, mm. that's the story for another day. So, yeah. so it is a valid point. As I talk about, though, in my in another book, I'll, I'll shamelessly plug: "Hire, Inspire, and Feel They're Fired." There are companies that do a great job at screening out jerks, and they focus relentlessly on a series of touch points with employees that are focused on culture and values and their personality. So they get the initials like. Okay, does this candidate even qualify in terms of the education we require, or the technical papers, or what, whatever the technical baseline requirement is? Get that out of the way. Then they focus relentlessly on trying to get to know this person and understand: Are they a fit for our culture? Will they By the help way, our culture grow? It goes both ways too, right? So we keep talking about this when you're bringing on your employees. You know, you, you got to screen them, you got to do your checks, and you got to understand their personality and, and blah 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 blah. But the proper vetting is done just from the employee, the, from the potential employee as well. And that's why it's so good to be able to articulate what the expectations are, what the culture is. Hey, if you come here, uh, and, and it works both ways, where sometimes uh, companies are full of it. They're full of the BS going, oh, yeah, we're happy-go-lucky, and we're this, and we're that. And then they all of a sudden, the employee gets in there, and they're like, this is, this is not what you said. Um, so the more upfront we can be in being communicative, yeah. communicative and honest and real and raw, uh, the better it is. I mean, yeah. a bit of a personal, uh, I, I recently started dating this lady, lady friend, and that was one of the things we decided. We said, look at upfront, none of this BS, none of this, I got to put up six inch heels and wear makeup and, uh, let's be real and show it up. Was not you would look fabulous. Sunday, though. I, I think you know, you know what? It's amazing. about the hype. I, I like to, yeah. you know, tower and command the room. So anyways, yes. Well, really good point. Frederick, and we're about to run out of time, but I want to cover what Frederick says. You know, he says Inc. had an article this morning. Oh, okay. Very topical about how to identify people who should not be leaders yet. The general theme is whether or not uh, they are all self-focused from discussing their work or do they emphasize the success uh, through others? Very, very yeah, good. That's good. Yeah. Well, and, and 
and self-screening out what you don't want to. I'm a big fan yeah. of companies doing that. I, I tell, tell my clients and audiences this all the time. Put it on your website. Not just Don't just bring your culture to life in an honest way, to Sanjay's point. Be, be relentlessly honest about what your work is like. It doesn't do anyone any good if you're not honest. Talk about what you are looking for in your employees, but also talk about what you aren't looking for and be honest about that. Yeah. If you've had employees that just drive you batty, Put that on your website. Say, here, here are the kind of employees we do not want coming and working with us. We do not want jerks who, and then list the behaviors and just be upfront about and, and that. And even show, show their picture. Like, I mean, yeah, my picture gets populated around the internet a lot. Do not be like Bob. We do right. not want people like Bob. He's worked with Bob. us for 12 years in accounting and oh my God, he drives everyone nuts. Yeah. So we have less than two minutes left. What, what, are, what can we conclude from this uh, wonderful discussion today of some of the issues that are going to come up. It's still kind of it, it, the whole inertia thing. Are we going to just move on anyway? Are we, yeah, don't be an a-hole as, uh, as Ashley <laughs> says. That's a, that's a very common. Uh, uh, that's a very common one. Uh, you know, what, what difference does it make if there's going to be a recession or not a recession uh, in terms of our culture, uh, the whole back to the office, you know, how is that going to play out? I think that's the kind of themes that I'm, that I'm hearing. I think that's going to give all of us who work in this field uh, and, and our audience who are obviously interested in this field a lot to work on this year. And I, and I think some of this can be encapsulated in the word uncertainty too, right? Yeah. And so yeah. that, that behooves leaders to think about how they're managing uncertainty in their workplace with their teams, yeah. with their employees, how they're yeah. communicating, how they're managing, how they're leading in continuingly uncertain times. Yeah. Yep. Uh, again, uh, it's it's exciting times too because we get to we get to dictate. We get to write the script uh, moving forward. And you know, are you, are you saying you want to be a dictator? Yeah. That, I heard that. Yeah, you know. no, totally. What do you mean want to? I am. Ask my kids. Oh, you can. Yeah. So yeah, no, there's new opportunities, but it's best done when it's intentional. Be clear on what you want. Articulate that to others. Communicate and attract the team that that best supports that. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to close with Stephen Rayfield's uh, wisdom uh, saying leaders need to continue to recalibrate their approaches. So, hey, when are we going to get back together, guys? I when? would say January 25th. Yeah, two weeks from today, January 25th. And when we'll have another rocking discussion on culture. So any final words, Sanjay or Mike? No. I just want to thank everybody for joining us and for the great yeah. comments and, and ideas and suggestions and questions and stuff in the in the chat box. You, as always, are brilliant. So thank you. Yes, happy 2023. Hope everyone rocks it. Looking yeah. forward to seeing you guys 26 more times this year. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. See you every other Wednesday. See you. Happy New Year, everyone. Bye.